2019 has been a great year. Good things have happened to everybody. In some way, good stuff's happened to you. And so we're going to talk about some things and make sure if it didn't happen to you, you can get out of the rut. But even if it did happen to you, we're going to go forward and have a great, great next year. Of course, the title of today is 2020 Vision. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> There will be a lot of titles, 2020 vision, but um, we can apply it that way. Looking forward, I suppose, uh, and we'll just we'll cover some basic principles today that we already know. But hey, look, we, we need them. We need them. Every one of us. I mean, the longer I go in Christ, the more I need to rehear stuff Amen. and right. and remind myself, and then slap myself in the face, and get back to my knees, and get back to the things I know. And uh, so forever and ever, you're going to have to hear those things. I mean, this is the way we make it. This is the way we succeed. I don't, I don't look for like brand new, uh, interesting, you know, shocking teachings every week. Have you noticed? I just don't do that. I don't do that because your ears shouldn't be itching. The Bible says in the last days, people will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Heap to themselves teachers. I think there's no greater day than this where people are heaping teachers. I mean, just gluttons upon gluttons, new teaching upon new teaching upon new preacher upon new preacher, so much that they're confused. So all of a sudden you hear a sentence said by somebody that goes against what you thought, but they're famous. Oh no, what have I been... It's just weird. I mean, it is difficult to keep people solid. You need to make a commitment to being solid. Get it in your heart. Know the Lord. Understand the word. And don't budge from it. No matter who says what. You need to be able to fit what other people have said in certain contexts. And also say, well, I kind of know where they were headed with that. But I'm not going to give any thought to it because it's a little confusing or a little off. I'll just trust that they were headed back to the right direction. So you need to be able to have a lot of mercy and grace when you hear other teaching and preaching so it doesn't disturb what you know. And if it's just really far out there, just shelve it and it won't matter to you. It's okay. So anyway, we need to be careful about not being such gluttons to find the next teaching, preaching, fancy thing to say. You know, there's really nothing new anyway. It's all just a new way to do it. You know, all this new terminology that entices people and excites people. I mean, there's new Christian words that are just like thrilling. I mean, we've been through the relevant. You had to be, for a while it was relevant and churches had to be relevant. Relevant to, well, I, I get that, but it just became this buzzword that everybody kind of flocked to and started judging people. Well, they're not relevant. Well, they're relevant. Well, they're not relevant. I want to be relevant. Please. <laughs> And then instead of calling it church and church family, now you call it community. That's the new buzzword. You got to be in a community, my community. It's a buzzword. It's it's, it's out there. I've seen it, heard it. I understand that it's important to some people, but don't let that be more important than the word of God. Little cute words and little cute ways to do things or say things or, you know, little buzzword stuff. Don't don't fall into that trap. Amen. 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 We're sticking to the Word of God. It brings life to us. The Word of God brings life, life, life. And those who love Jesus stick together. And we need to. We need to. Jesus paid a dear price so that we could have the church, so that we could have His body. And so it's all about His body. It's all about the body of Christ sticking together and being sharpened together. Like we've said before, you, can't, you can never develop the love walk without being part of a local church, a local assembly of of believers, a tight group, a solid uh, worshiping group, those who worship and pray and live together from house to house and in the synagogue. Not the synagogue, but the church building. There's the main assembly and then there's other group. There's friends. So there's no way to grow in love. There's no way to please the Lord fully without being connected to his people. So let's relish in that. Let's enjoy that. That's part of this whole deal. That's right. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, we're going to read some things here. Go to Philippians chapter four. Um, this is Paul preaching. Now, people still today, people still balk at following the apostle Paul. Uh, still today, I keep hearing uh, occasional people that want to discredit 
the apostles' writings, the letters, and focus more heavily on the four Gospels of Jesus, trying to give more clout to Jesus by despising or counting little or nothing the letters that were written after Jesus' resurrection. That is wrong. Amen. That is an insult to Jesus Christ. Right, right. That is an insult. You cannot do that. The words of Jesus occurred in the four Gospels. They occurred before the four Gospels. And they occurred after the four... Those are, the whole Bible is the words of Jesus. Right. He is the Word of God. Amen. The whole Old Testament is the Word of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He is the Word. Amen. So you can't discredit the Old Testament and you can't discredit the letters written by the apostles. Absolutely not. Matter of fact, the, the letters of Paul are really the advanced teachings of Jesus Christ. They're the teachings that could only happen after people receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't even explain half of who we are. He didn't explain what the new creature in Christ was all about. Not until Paul did the church understand the new birth. Right. Jesus said you need to be born again. He never told what that meant. Not at all. Right. He never explained the new birth. <laughs> he said, I got a lot more to tell you. I bet that was one of them. Right. I got a lot more to tell you. But you can't bear it now. But when He, the Holy Spirit, has come, He's going to guide you into all truth. How do you think He did it? Just by osmosis? Well, there's an inward witness from the Spirit that is undeniable, but He did it through revelation knowledge. And that's why Paul talked about, I got this by revelation. Without Paul's letters, you won't understand Christianity. You won't understand the new birth. You won't understand righteousness. So don't let anybody try to discredit the words of Paul the Apostle and try to say, well, who are we going to trust, Jesus or Paul? Now, what are you going to say to that? See, that's a trick question. So anyway, I get a little riled up about it because I see people getting thrown off course. Thrown off course. Jesus didn't explain one thing about how the church should be. All Jesus said about the church is, I'm going to build my church on the revelation that I'm the Christ. But at the time of Jesus, there was only one cornerstone. Have you ever tried to live in a house that only had one cornerstone? <laughs> Living on just one cornerstone means you're a bum. <laughs> you don't have a house. No. Living on one cornerstone is not enough. You need the whole house built. He was the chief cornerstone. And then it says the church is built upon him and the apostles and prophets. So we have to be okay with that. So anyway, I think a lot of times the reason people try to dismiss the letters that explain the church and all the order of things and the spirit filled life uh, is because they really don't want to be part of that. They want to just believe in Jesus in their own way, do their own thing, and not have to obey the Holy Spirit at all. Make up their own truths. Make up their own culturally relevant lifestyle. Oh no, oh no. Paul explained how church ought to be. Peter explained how church ought to be. John the Apostle explained how church ought to be. Jude said, you better watch it. He's coming with flaming vengeance to do something to this world. Okay, so the apostles had some very serious things to say to the church. All right. So since we're okay with Paul the Apostle, Amen. <clears throat> matter of fact, let me read you, let me read you a quote uh, from a, a great, great uh, famous preacher. <clears throat> he said, Paul's letters contain the best explanation of Christianity in the world. The right way to look at them is to regard them as the continuation of Jesus, of Christ's own teaching. They contain the thoughts that Jesus carried away from this world unuttered. Wow. No great preacher has arisen to bless the people of God who has not lighted his torch at the flame kindled by Paul. Whole sermons may be found in separate words, 
whole volumes in single sentences. Tell me that's not the word of God. Even after 1900 years, Paul is preaching every week in a thousand languages in a hundred thousand pulpits all over the world. We'd probably say a million pulpits at least all over the world. So don't tell me it's not the word of God and that it's not supernatural. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Philippians chapter four. So let's talk about uh, pushing the reset button. Let's talk about going forward. Let's talk about hitting the turbo boost, whatever you, wherever stage you're at. Okay. Cause when I don't like to assess years necessarily for my own personal life. But there are times in life when you certainly need to push a reset button or you need to hit the turbo boost or the power boost or the get out of this rut button. At the church here, we have an easy button. And so anytime, anytime we run into a problem that it seems difficult to solve, we just press it in the name of when we get over to the new building, all problems are solved. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's false hope because I think the new campus will create many more problems and we're counting on you guys to stick with us through every one of them. Amen. We're counting on all of you to be there to solve every problem. You're the body that gets to jump in and save the day at every turn of every problem of every person, because there'll be more people, more stuff to do. Uh, and so it's going to get bigger and bigger and grander for the purpose of changing lives and helping the community and helping the city and really doing something for God, doing something for the kingdom with the motivation of where we love people Amen. and we want people to grow. And we want people helped and we want to see their lives changed and we want to be tender toward people and effective toward people and everything we're doing is for people. Right. And so it's not about you anymore. Like I said before, if you're in Houston Faith Church already, no longer is church about you. It's about the next person who's not yet committed to the Lord in a real way. Of course, it's kind of about you, but not nearly, for your own sake, it's not about you. For your own mentality, it's not about you. It's got to be about somebody else. That's the Christian life. It's about living for somebody else living to bless somebody else, that's what we're trying to develop us into. Amen. You follow me? So that we're world changers, people changers, people blessers, co community savers. We're, we're, we're change agents. We're kingdom of, we're light bringers. Yes. So I'm glad you're part of that. It's going to get enhanced over there. We're going to have to raise our soul goal. Amen. And one, if we're going to raise our soul goal, then more of you are going to have to get involved in going out with the teams. Amen. Amen. I'll just say that uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We need more, 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 more kingdom work. And in the more kingdom work, you'll see your life gets blessed more. Right. Right. So today is not about you chasing more blessings. Uh, you're going to have to live blessed. So anyway, verse... Chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, Philippians 4 verse 11. Uh, verse 10 kind of sets up, I mean, it's kind of the, the, the context, you'll see it in verse 10. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you sure, surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. This whole chapter basically uh, or, or from here on, it begins him talking about how the, the church at Philippi helped him in the ministry. Like they cared for his, his uh, material things and they took care of him. And then he says, oh, but you, you didn't have the opportunity to keep doing it. But now you're getting back to it. And so he says, not that I speak in regard to need. For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. So, so ministers, so Paul here is kind of showing how ministers, uh, ministers should never act needy. Mm -hmm. Those who are getting supported by the church in some way should never act needy. That's what he's saying. I'm not talking about me being needy because I've learned whatever state I'm in, I'm content. Like if I'm in Texas, I'm content. If I'm in Ohio, I'm content. If I'm in Louisiana, <laughs> and I'm content. No, whatever condition your life is in. 
Are you content? He learned how to be content. If you're going to get out of any rut, if you're going to be spiritually strong, this is kind of a principle of spiritual growth. If you're going to grow spiritually, if you're going to be strong, you're going to have to learn, learn whatever moment your life is in to be content. Verse 12, I know how to be abased and I know how to, how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Did you know that you can have some lacks in your life but still feel like you're abounding? Yes. I mean, even if you're eating Roman noodles or... Beanie weenies or whatever those, those. Spam, I don't know. Does anybody ever eat spam anymore? You do what you got to do, right? <clears throat> whatever you're eating, whatever you have the money for, wherever you're at, whatever you're driving, you have to be content. Well, let's say it this way. You need to learn how to be content. You need to learn how to be content. For as long as it takes, whatever place you're at. Learn how to be content. Whatever job you're at, learn how to be content. Whatever position you're in, learn how to be content. Learn how to be content. Know how, know how to abound and know how to also be happy even if you're suffering some need. Amen. It won't last long, but I would say it won't last long if. Mm-hmm. It won't last long if. This is spiritual growth here. This is God getting involved in your spiritual life if. Isn't that right? Some people say, well, you know, everything will just always turn out uh, because, you know, I'm a Christian or because God loves me. No, it won't always just always turn out. It'll turn out if. It'll turn out if. So I, I like the encouragement where we say, oh, no, don't worry. God will always. That's true if. He will turn all things together for good if. To those that love the Lord and those that are called according to His purpose. But man, if you look at all the blessings and promises of God, there's ifs attached to a bunch of them. Okay? And so you can't just blatantly say that and just kind of cover everything up. No, no, there's some ifs in there. And let's just, we're going through how to get out of the, we're going through how you can get out of any kind of spiritual rut to make sure everything's flowing still in your life. The joy, the love, the glory, the presence of God, all that. So here he says, verse 13 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So there's a setup to that scripture. The setup is you need to learn how to be content. So that's the first point is you're going to have to learn how to be content. Now go to Philippians chapter 3 here. Verse 12, Paul says, uh, not that I've already attained. He's talking about it. He's talking about giving up everything for Christ so that he would know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. But then he says, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the mark or the goal for the prize of the upward call or the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Then he says, verse 15, let us therefore as many as are mature have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, then God will reveal even this to you. Like, if you don't believe me, well, God will show you. Isn't that interesting? So don't think you're better than this. What he's saying. Don't think you got it all figured out. You're going to have to forget the things that are behind. So whatever didn't go right the past year or 10 years, forget it. When will you forget it? Amen. When will you stop dwelling on what you did wrong in the past or what wrong was done to you in the past or what could have been better in the past or how unfulfilled dreams are still around? When are you going to forget the past? That's right. When? What stops you from forgetting the past? Maybe you need to read the scripture a hundred times. Maybe you need to say it out loud a thousand times. Forget the past, forget the past, forget the past. I mean, preachers have come up with every example they can to help you forget the past. Right, right. You know, the big, you're dri- it's like driving a car. You got a big windshield and a tiny rear view mirror. Right. 
Why is that? So that your forward vision is much bigger than your rear view vision. Haven't you heard that before? When are you going to live it? You're going to have to live it or it won't work for you. Okay? The glory won't be seen. The God's glory will be missed if you don't get that straight in your life. Don't consider all of the didn't happens. All of the how bad it is. Don't consider it. Listen, this is part of life. Part of life is things won't go like you expected. So what? When are you going to be tough about it? When are you going to smile and laugh in the face of it? You know, some of you older folks can understand. I'm beginning to understand. But this applies even to the younger folks. Younger folks still have these immediate dreams and desires that when they're not fulfilled, causes depression, causes real anger, causes real turmoil. Listen, teenagers, teenagers, the scripture is for you. Forget those things which are behind. Stay content in whatever you got. Whoever you are, whatever you have. Whatever you look like in the mirror, Come on. be content right. in whatever state you have. You must do the word. Right. The word is there to cause us to succeed in life in every area. Do this part. Be content and stop looking behind or to yesterday. Turn with me to Matthew 18. You know, part of, part of this is to see your future, you have to clear the haze. Yes. To see the dream, to see the, the good thing, to see the hope set before you, you have to clear the haze out of your mind. The haze is all of the chatter. It's all of the social media pressure. It's all of the comparing You to others, family members, other peers. The haze can the haze includes all of your past, all of your failures, all of that inside of you that you know you want to change but haven't. You gotta forget all that. That's that's stopping you from moving forward. We don't want people to listen, we don't want people to wait for the dream to happen before they're content. Amen. You, you may move one day. You, you may get married one day. You may get a better job one day. You may get a job one day. You, you, you may get a degree one day. Things in your li- life season may change, but you can't wait for it in order to be happy. Amen. You will never be a happy person if that's how you think you're living. No, whatever place you're at, be happy today. Amen. Be content today. Be full of life and joy today or you'll never be happy. We can't allow ourselves to defer our hope for something in the future. Well, one day when all my friends like me, well, one day when I'm accepted and known, one day when I'm famous, you know, people want to be a famous blogger when I have a famous YouTube channel. Kids are growing up with the dream that they just simply want to be a blog. What is it? A vlogger, a blogger. They want to be famous on the internet. That's a false dream. That's wrong uh, thinking, and we gotta we gotta stop our kids from from going there. That is not life. If you have a grace and something of the Lord, then sure, maybe you could be that. But let's not defer all of our excitement and joy and hope and dream for maybe one day I could be famous. Being famous is not a good dream. You're not allowed to want to be famous. None of you. None of you, just from right here, Houston Faith Church, on this day, in this hour, you are not allowed to want to be famous. None of you. That is not a good dream. That is glory seeking. That is selfish ambition. That is not allowed in the Christian's life or heart or mind. Not even a secret dream to be famous. Matthew chapter 18. So. So the first one is uh, be content. Second is to forget the past. And the third here uh, tip for the new year is 
walk in love. Or I want to kind of address forgiveness. I would say forgiveness is probably one of the first places to start walking in love. Walking in love does not mean to start having good feelings for everybody. Walking in love doesn't have anything to do with your feelings. Walking in love has to do with your actions and your attitudes. And the way that you control yourself with people and the way that you consider other people before yourself. No, amen, bro. Well, I got to write. I got to write. I got to write from the front row. Listen, walking in love doesn't have anything to do with how you feel. It has to do with how you act. It has to do with what you allow to happen on the inside of you. Uh, so forgiveness is part of this. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Peter came to the Lord and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Anybody got a calculator? 490 times. 490 times. How many of you feel you're at the 489th time? Listen, Christians, Christians somehow fast forward the counting. And they, they seem to do a really good job forgiving a little to some people. But then as soon as it's somebody important to them, uh, they fast forward it up to 489 times. And then they're waiting for that final one. That's it. I'm gone. I'm out of your life. You, nope, you didn't meet my expectation. And therefore, I'm gone. You can't do that. Not if you're going to succeed. Not if you're going to have a great year. Not if you're going to get out of the rut. Not if you're going to win. Not if you're going to... Please the Lord. You can't live your life like that. You're going to have to forgive and forgive and forgive. And you can't let grudges build up. You can't get little attitudes in your mind about people. Amen. Listen, I, I've been in church a long time and I know how the devil will help you. He will. He helps people all the time. The Holy Spirit is supposed to be your helper, not the devil. The devil helps people get into anger and bitterness quickly. The devil helps people skip forgiving number three through 480 and all of a sudden that's it. They've done it one too many times. Oh, they've done it 490 times. So you're going to have to forgive everybody, everybody, everybody that's hurt you, everybody that neglected you, everybody that forgot about you. When, when will you forget? When will you forgive them all? When can you forget? Maybe you got to forget sins against you. When are you going to forget people's sins against you? Go to Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you, shall, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. That, that's from God. God will make sure that you, you, you get what you've given. It's just the way it is, okay? That if your heart is in a certain bend toward something or somebody, that's how God's able to get it back to you. If you're off, what you get is off. It's just a law that nobody, not even God, can get around. Sowing and reaping, it's seed time and harvest law. And you got to be very careful with how you, how you set your heart, how you set the thermostat of your soul, of your judgments, of your thinkings. Yes. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. Every time I read this and plan to preach it, I think I'm going to go, I'm going to get a big old bore two by four and show you how silly that would be to walk over with a two by four in your face and try to go get somebody's splinter out of theirs. Be like, golly, I can't, what are you doing? You coming at me with, with all of your stuff. Now, when it says don't judge, listen. There, there's other scripture that talk about 
we judge things inside the church. God judges those who are outside the church. There is judgment given inside for, for different things. Jesus is the judge of the church, you understand? But then Paul said, hey, you need to judge what has happened here. So listen, judgment does not mean pointing out somebody's wrong action that might have caused harm or, or done something negative. We, we are allowed to judge actions, okay? Like your boss at work, he's allowed to judge your actions. He's allowed to judge your words. You can get fired. That is allowed. Okay? Performance can be judged. What can't be judged is heart motives. I don't know why you did it, so I can't guess. So when it says don't judge, it's about guessing other people's faults and conditions and problems. But certainly if someone's done something wrong, they can be called in. And they don't get to come in and say, don't judge me. That would be silly for anybody to go to their boss who has called them in to correct them and they say, you can't judge me. That's not judging. Or we can say that's judging, but it's judging outside performance. That's acceptable. Do you understand? I don't think you're all convinced. The problem is that people go around when somebody points out one of their problems. Because let's, let's get real clear about this. Somebody points out another person's problems and what is the typical reaction? They bow up. I mean, even if they're sitting down, they stand up on the inside. And, and they even say this, don't judge me. Don't judge me. And maybe sometimes they have a point, but I mean, maybe, maybe they have, you know, some right to say that, but other times they don't. Because notice what the scripture says. It doesn't say never go get the speck out of your brother's eye. Does it? It says get the plank out of yours first. Verse 5, hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. That means there's somebody in your life that needs to come help you get the speck out of your eye. And so when that person comes to you or offers to help you, you don't look at them and say, don't judge me. You need to judge yourself. You need to say to yourself, you know, maybe there is a speck in my eye. The problem is so many people ignore the plank in their eye. And that's the real point. I mean, so many people ignore all of their stuff and, and, and let themselves get mad at others. Like you don't have any stuff. I mean, it's the truth. Think of all the things people might have against you. That ought to just stop you right there from ever judging somebody else. And if you don't think, if you think everybody in the whole world just loves you to pieces <laughs> and doesn't think you've ever done anything wrong, I mean, there's like one person that's your mother. It might feel that way. Not every mother. That's the only hope for you to be a perfect in everybody's, in somebody's eye. But just think about what God knows, what God sees, and how He forgives, and how He, he gets over it. Okay? You have to be the same. So there's no reason to judge somebody for, you know, well, I, didn't, I don't appreciate their, who cares what, who cares? Maybe nobody appreciates it, but you got to love them. Maybe nobody appreciates it, but you got to forgive them. <clears throat> Go to Matthew chapter 6. Oh, it's right there. They put it right next to 7. When the Holy Spirit is present, anything can be funny. <laughs> Y'all think sometimes I'm funny? I'm not funny. It's just the anointing, the Holy Spirit. That's, that's usually, in, in the anointing, no matter, no matter what, the things can be, have a big smile about it. Matthew chapter 6. Here's the next, next um, point. 
the next tip to, to get out of the rut, to, to, make a, to make a change, to have a good year, to press the button. Matthew 6. <clears throat> Matthew 6, verse 24. Okay, I'm going to read this whole passage. I almost didn't, but I'm going to. Matthew 6, 24, because this is basic Christianity. And what I want you to see is you have to get back. Sometimes you have to get back to basic Christianity. Amen. We move on into the glorious things and we forgot basic stuff. Try to be great Christians, but you can't forget the basics. Okay. Matthew 6, verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Your Bible say mam mammon? mammon. Uh, what else could that word be? Money. Could be money. Uh, it really refers to this, this world's goods or material goods. So you can't serve God and money. You can't serve God and stuff. And this is where I think today's church, especially in America, has, has a real challenge because stuff is so readily available. I mean, one click. Now I don't even have to enter a card. I just one click, buy now, boom, done. Got it. And I can just click, 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 click. And that's okay. I, I love the convenience of it. Uh, but you and I have to be very careful not to serve stuff or serve money. Like, you know how exciting it is to, uh, to have ordered something and you know it's supposed to arrive at some point? <laughs> like how boring, how boring the days are when you know nothing's coming. <laughs> what great flutter of heart happens when you remember, oh yes, my thing's coming. That's why we love Brother Fela and a couple others here more than anybody else. <laughs> but um, that's just a, little, just a little surface thing, okay? Because that's okay. It's no big deal. Um, <clears throat> but you ought to be happier or just as much flutter when you think about a scripture or about the presence of God or about, yeah. ooh, I'm going to pray in tongues for 30 minutes and the Holy Spirit's going to comfort me. You get a leap, you get an unction, you get an excitement, a little flutter. And so you have to be the judge in your own life what's making you happiest. Because the substitute for the Holy Spirit many times is shopping. Or having your football team win. There I went and done it. Meddled in people's lives. But you can't serve God and mammon. So let, let's at least say that your pursuit of money and desire for money, uh, you can't have that and desire for God. I said you can't desire making more money right. and God. Right. So the rule is you're not allowed to be rich. You're not allowed to want to be rich. You can get wealthy and you should be successful in your life because you're walking with God. But you can't desire to be rich. Those that desire to be rich fall into what? Snares. Temptation and a snare. So you're not allowed to want more money. Right. It's a real paradox. You can have more money and riches will be in your house if you walk with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And follow Bible principles, follow money principles, but you're not allowed to want it. Mm -hmm. So you, you're not allowed to sit there and pine away about what if I, if I just had a little bit more, if I just had a little bit more, well, one day when I have a little bit more, well, I, if I could just get another client, if I can just get another sale, if I can just get a, you can't live like that. Right. That's serving mammon. You can't serve God and mammon. Because you'll either love the one and hate the other, hate the one and love the other. Verse 25, therefore, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Of course, those are basic necessities that most of you already have enough of. But now you just worry about the bills and the extra stuff. Or we could just say this whole chapter is about basic stuff. The whole chapter is about your life needs. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? 
Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Yeah. Oh, you wonderful Christian. <laughs> now, he thro Jesus throws in this little facetious thing. Oh, you of little faith. Why does he do that? He does it to, to, to jumpstart you. He does it to remind you, look, what are you doing? Verse 31, therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or how are we going to pay the bills? So out of all this, it says do not worry. So in 2019, has anybody worried about their financial situation? They're not raising their hand, brother. I'm, I'm just I'm trying not to look too hard. Has anybody worried about their financial situation? You're not supposed to. You don't, you don't need to. You're not supposed to worry at all about money. But not just be blind to it. You know, I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to think. I'm just not going to think about it. You're thinking about it. That's not faith. Faith is not just, you know, trying to not think about it. Faith is about replacing that thought with a new thought. How about Matthew, 25, Matthew 6, 25 thought? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat and all that? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Those that don't have God in their life seek these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So there's the big if. And the, the and or the if. That's the big if. That's the condition. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these things are added. So if you've had any financial strain, seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness and everything's taken care of. How do you do that? Well, seek first the kingdom means let, let's put some emphasis on God's way. Let's get closer to Him. Seek Him. Seek the kingdom of God and His right standing. Stay close to Him. Put more uh, uh, pressure on that spiritual side of things. Spend more time on the spiritual side of things. Don't neglect spiritual things. This is where many who are under financial strain fall apart. It's hard, it's hard to, to focus on spiritual things when you know that money's tied. When, when there's no answers, it's, it's hard. But this is basic. To get out of your rut, you're going to have to seek first the kingdom of God. Get back to Him. Over in Revelation chapter 2, Jesus said, you know, you left your first love. He goes, I got something against you. You left your first love. And if you don't get back to it, I'm taking the candlestick out. You left your first love. You can't leave your first love. You must get back to the things that, that make for happy, brand new Christian living. Get back to basic Christianity. Matthew 6, basic Christianity. Basic trust with a heavenly father. No matter how rich you are, no matter how much money you make, you have to stay pure. Get back to the Bible. So you can't just think to yourself, everything will be okay if you're not seeking the kingdom of God. The only answer for your life if you're stuck is to get back to the Word of God. Get back to the Holy Spirit. Get back to the, to the presence of God. Amen. 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 Until you can again delight in the Lord, then you don't get the desires of your heart. They kind of like pause. Have you ever noticed that? When you're not delighting in the Lord, everything just kind of pauses. So you have to learn how to delight in the Lord. You have to love Sunday morning church. Amen. I know you do, but you, you have to like church time. You have to like prayer times. You have to like fasting together. Amen. See how that threw that in there? Glory. <clears throat> hey, look, I, I feel the same way that you do about fasting. Right now, I feel the same way about you. 
We're all dreading Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Your flesh is thinking, that's, not, that's no way to ring in the new year. But, but the real you on the inside is like, we're going to do it. That's right. We, we need to do it. We want to do that. We want to do that. That'll set us up better. Yes. Right? Yes. Matthew uh, chapter, no, no, let's go to um, Philippians 4. Back to Philippians 4. Oh, I guess we need to pretty, up, pretty, pretty um, quickly end this, but back to Philippians 4, just a final reminder maybe. So concerning seeking the Lord, uh, you know, sometimes your life builds these habits and ruts that you don't want. And so what you have to do is make a real radical change or a radical Come decision. Okay? And it's, it's got to be more radical than a New Year's resolution. It's got to be a three week in a row, you know, forced change in my life. And all I'm talking about is just more time with God. I'm just talking about prayer time. I'm just talking about praying in tongues more, which, you know, we, we, we've been teaching on this all year long, praying in tongues more. You hear that every year, uh, many times a year from us, because praying in tongues is what really keeps you sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Praying in tongues is where you're, uh, where you're empowered from heaven. Right. It's where you're comforted from the Holy Spirit. It's where you're more sensitive to His leading. And so we're talking about just pray, praying more and reading your Bible more. Just spending, just weaving out, carving out some spiritual time every day. And I'm, you know, the radical point is you might have to just really shut down everything. I mean, you might have to do every, you might have to t take the cell phone battery out or you might have to, you might have to do something really radical for an hour every day right. until you get in the habit of things. Good. It's the only way to reset, the, is reset your life and get back on course, okay? You're going to have to really be radical and, and decide, you know what? Jesus is at the end of this hour, and I've got to find Him. Amen. The Holy Spirit is at the end of this 30 minutes in tongues, and I, I'm going there. I'm going there. I'm going there. I mean, you have been determined to get to that grocery store before closing. <laughs> you know, you've got to have the thing. Well, you need to be determined to get to the Holy Spirit for 30 minutes. That means no dogs, no cats, no kids, no spouse, no nothing going on around me. I am, I am closed off Amen. for 30 minutes. And if you can't get to him in 30 minutes, then you need to go for an hour. And if you're still so uh, fleshy that it takes you two to three hours, then you go two to three hours. And what you'll find is that over time, it'll be easier and quicker to get to the Holy Spirit. Because Amen. Amen. we know how we can be. And to be honest, most of us, when we start praying, it feels like an impossible quest. When you start praying in tongues or when you start seeking the Lord, many times to the, to the flesh and the mind, it feels like, you know, this is just never going to happen. No, no telling how long it'll take me. It'll probably take me 15 hours. Might as well not even try then. I don't have 15 hours. And that stops a lot of people's prayer lives. It won't take that long, okay? Your flesh thinks it, it won't take that long. If you just use your spirit, man, you can get to him quickly. Amen. He's there. He's, he, he'll come quickly. God never withholds himself when you seek him. Okay, he never will delay. Oh, well, no, you've, you've been putting me off now for three weeks and I'm going to put you off now for, for at least three hours. I'm going to put you off too. No, that's vindictive. He's not like that. He's going to honor his word. What does his word say? He says, if you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. And so what you'll be surprised in is that you start praying in tongues. If you, if you determine, I'm going 30 minutes in tongues all out. Glory. I'm not talking about just, you know. <laughs> now, then you can do that. But I'm talking about all out. If you just decide to all out, all of a sudden his presence will be there in five minutes. Glory. All of a sudden you'll get answers in 10 minutes. All of a sudden the glory will come in 15 minutes. All of a sudden you'll hear his voice again. Things will be glorious again. Scriptures will come to your mind. Joy will, 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 will fill your heart. You'll go to work happy. Just take a little bit more time with him. For one, if you get in the word of God, it'll help you think right. Part of the problem is we've been thinking on wrong things and you don't know how to get out of it. This is where depression hits people. This is where uh, hopelessness hits people. And uh, just 
zaps everybody's initiative when you start thinking about stuff too much that you can't really do anything about anyway. Right. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's any pray, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Or King James says, think on these things. So we like to go backwards in this. Think on what? What do you mean think on? Well, that means what your mind thinks on ought to fit, you know, fit these categories. So you, you know, most of you know this, but in case you don't, let me just, let me explain to you. These are the only things you're allowed to think on. That eliminates think on what somebody did to you. Think on how much you don't like so-and-so. Think about how unhappy you are at your current blah, blah, blah. Think about what you're missing. Think about the greener grass. Think of, you following me? This is where you people get in trouble. They start thinking about wrong things. All of those, all thoughts must fit each of these. Whatever things are true. Some people say, well, see, I'm thinking on the truth. It's true, man. They just hate me. It's true. I hate him. It's true that they did that. That's true. So I can think of it. No, it's got to fit the next category. It's got to be noble or honorable. And then whatever things are just, it's got to be just and true. It's got to be pure and noble. Whatever things are lovely, it's got to be lovely and true and pure and just. And whatever things are of good report. So if it's a bad report, you can't think on it. This is one reason why I have a hard time sharing bad reports. I don't like to share bad reports because I don't think about bad reports. It's just the way I feel. I, I don't really want to be a giver of bad news. I'm a giver of good news. But if you think on bad report enough, that's what you'll be reporting. And you know, f friends and family and yourself... And that's why if you fill yourself with channel 1210, wait, what, what channel do you, I don't know. Fill yourself with politics, fill yourself with what's wrong in the world, uh, you've just denied scripture. How about a better 2020? I don't care who runs for office. Hey, amen. How about a better 2020? To, to get a better 2020, you're going to have to Go ahead and acknowledge how smart you are and right you are about everything. And then stop thinking about it. Stop thinking about how you're going to wrong every right, every wrong. You're going to right every wrong. Uh, and and how, how you can't believe, I can't believe, I can't believe what they, I can't either. I can't. Now, now can we move on, please? Can we go ahead and just realize the devil has pushed people's buttons for centuries and will continue until he's chained in the lake of fire? Isn't that right? And just move on and start thinking about pure and lovely things. Amen. Need something to think about? Think about Pastor Joni. Yeah. <laughs> think about somebody at church who, 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 who you just know is a better Christian than you. <laughs> think about somebody who at least looks like a better Christian. Think of somebody who looks happy. Amen. Think of something good. You got to have to do this. This is this is now you got a big assignment. This is a huge assignment to to train your brain, train your thoughts, because most of your troubles start in your brain, in your mind. Right. Praise the Lord. And then verse nine, he says, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. <laughs> and the God of peace will be with you. I say all the time. Paul, the apostle, is the best example of a Christian that the church has ever seen. And if he's not the best, he's one of the best Christians the church has ever seen. And that's why we can follow Paul. He said, follow me like I follow Christ. And if you do what you've seen in me, <laughs> you'll have peace in your life. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. I'm closing the book. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, we're cutting out some old stuff, thinking on some new stuff. We're going to break the rear view mirror. Well, no, the rear view mirror is okay. You can glance just to recall a couple things here and there. Uh, just to, you know, so you don't go backwards, recognize what you want to avoid. You know, you can keep the rear view mirror there maybe, but let's, let's be right wise about it, right? You know, I can acknowledge things in my life that, uh, you know, I, I didn't like or wish were different or whatever. But let's get over that. Let's move on here. Let's move on. Let's recognize that Jesus is coming and that we're just really trying to shoot for him. Well, everything we're doing right now is for the next 50 years so that, so that heaven can record the good stuff. Amen. Come on. It's all about treasure in heaven. It's all about the well done, good and faithful servant. Everything we do right now is all about because you can't take all of the accolades. Uh, you can't even take your pictures. You know, we try to save all of our pictures on cell phones from, from phone to phone. You want to keep all your memories and your pictures. You can't even take that to heaven. <laughs> no. all right. You can't take money to heaven or that or any kind of accolade or any kind of position. Um, what you can take is people. And what you can actually do is, is reserve treasure ahead of time in heaven. But to reserve treasure in heaven, you have to give treasure in the earth. So that you can lay up, for tre lay up in heaven for, with, where, where nobody can get it. And rust can't touch it. And moths can't eat it, right? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. So that's what it's all about. Thanks, Jesus is coming soon. That's right. He's coming soon. So let's make sure 2020 is a good year. That's right. yeah. Let's do whatever it takes to get out of any rut. Let's be more spiritual. You know you want to be. And when we say more spiritual, we're not talking about weirder. No. We're talking about happier. Yes. We're talking about happier in the Lord. We're talking about more full of joy in the Lord. Right. Closer to Him, closer to His Spirit, closer to His Word. That's how you get happy. Being more religious or more spiritual, you know, it, it has to do with you getting closer to God. And right. nobody is sad close to God. Right. Not one person is ever sad close to God. So if you thought you were close, if you're sad and you thought you were close to God, you weren't close to God. <laughs> you have to be honest about these things. You know, this takes honesty. To walk with the Lord, it takes honesty. You just got to be honest. Praise the Lord. I know everybody's happier now because you've been in church for a little while. And the Word of God, I just, I just typed a note to somebody recently that, hey, look, the only, the only real answer I can give you is uh, let the Word of God wash over you and you'll be better. Every hour, every Sunday morning is better because the Word washed over. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. More information about Stevenson Ministries and Houston Faith Church is available online at HoustonFaith.tv. Chaz and Joni Stevenson are the pastors of a dynamic, growing church in Houston, Texas, and have a New Testament vision of preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit helping people get saved, and building strong Christians who can impact their world. Houston Faith Church is a place where the love of God is real, where lives are changed, and where followers of Jesus become fishers of men.